Welcome all of you to this live program at Orthopedic Principles. Today, our guest of honor is Dr. Arun Hariharan from Southwest Florida. Dr. Hariharan is a fellowship trained pediatric orthopedic surgeon at Pediatric Orthopedics of Southwest Florida. Dr. Hariharan completed his medical school at the University of Michigan and then completed his orthopedic residency at the University of Maryland. He then pursued a pediatric orthopedic fellowship at the Nemo Alpha DuPont Hospital at Wilmington, Delaware. To further advance his spine surgery skill set, he traveled to Auckland, New Zealand to train at the Starship Children's Hospital for an additional spine fellowship. He was awarded the Russell A. Hibbs Best Clinical Research Paper Award and the Louis A. Goldstein Best Clinical Research Poster Paper Award at the International Spine Research Society meeting in 2020. So today it's my great honor to introduce you to Dr. Arun Harihara from Southwest Florida. Oh, Darun. Thank you so much. Um, this is a wonderful opportunity. I think what you're doing with the orthopedic principles and the videos, I've used them in the past and it's, um, it's wonderful. I really commend you for the work. Thanks for having me. So today uh, I'd like to talk about the treatment of scoliosis, specifically in neuromuscular conditions and talk about uh, the advances and controversies. And um, you know, I'd like to really acknowledge people before I get started, because uh, as a young surgeon in practice, I don't think I would be able to talk about these things with the ability that I can uh, without my mentors and teachers, and uh, specifically Dr. Sukhan Shah and Jason Howard at uh, Nemours Children's Hospital in Wilmington, Delaware. And I'd also like to refer you to these two review articles um, that have a really nice overview of caring for children with scoliosis, specifically in cerebral palsy. But as you'll see, many of the uh, you know, treatment plans can be applied across a wide array of neuromuscular spectrums. So uh, neuromuscular scoliosis, again, we'll talk a lot about cerebral palsy, but CP really is a heterogeneous group of conditions. It's, it's not a diagnosis in and of itself. It really means it's a permanent, non-progressive abnormality of brain function. And many other neuromuscular conditions we may think of and hear of are Rett syndrome, spinal muscular atrophy, muscular dystrophy, and spina bifida, and even spinal cord injuries really fall into this category. So let's talk about prevalence of spinal deformity. In, in CP in general, again, this is an all-encompassing uh, condition, the overall incidence anywhere from 25 to 65%. And, but really, again, CP is a huge mix of patients. Uh, you know, we used to talk about it just in terms of diplegia or monoplegia or ambulatory, non-ambulatory, but this GMFCS classification really lets us talk about it in a more refined way and communicate with each other on really what the functional level of and the neurologic involvement of these patients are. So in GMFCS 1 and 2, where the kids are pretty ambulatory and don't need much in terms of support, it's pretty rare to get scoliosis, and it's really like AIS <clears throat> more than a neuromuscular scoliosis. And then when you go to GMFCS4 and 5, it's much greater neurologic involvement, and the rate really jumps up, up to 70%. And in some institutions, they've even reported up to 100%. And it's really related, again, to the neurologic involvement. And the spastic quadriplegia patients have the highest prevalence. And um, reports vary for the other neuromuscular conditions I mentioned, but as you can see, it's a pretty high number for patients with Rett syndrome or SMA or muscular dystrophy. So really, you know, even before we dive into everything, it's important to state that x-ray and clinical surveillance are key for these patients. In terms of the causes of the neuromuscular scoliosis, it's really, as far as we know, related to the level of neurologic involvement. And with that comes the ambulatory capacity. And we think it's really because of general poor muscle control in the growing spine. And there's really a lack of the compensatory mechanisms from surrounding muscle and bodily function control to hold the spine in a straight fashion. And of course, things like spasticity, cerebellar disorders leading to poor balance and overall muscle weakness definitely contribute. And this is a common type of scoliosis you'll see. It's long and C-shaped. There's associated pelvic obliquity. There's a collapsing kyphosis, which I'll show you a great example of later, and ultimately loss of sitting balance. So what's the natural history of these curves? In, in young children in early childhood, it's pretty small and flexible. If you see a stiff 
curve with rapid progression in a young child who you think has a neuromuscular condition, you really have to think about congenital syndromes, maybe like Beal syndrome, for example. And in middle childhood, it's more of a postural kyphosis it's, or scoliosis. It's there, but it's easily correctable and uh, very flexible. But really be aware of these young kids uh, who have more than a 40 degree curve because the chance of progression is quite great. And once they hit the adolescent growth spurt, this is when it really dramatically increases. And again, this is related to a decline in function and poor muscle control. And you can see it go two to four degrees per month or even more. And once the curve goes over that 45, 50 degree mark, you start seeing other orthopedic deformities involving the pelvis and the hips. And you can see a windswept deformity here where one side, the femoral head really drives into the acetabulum and the other side leads to a dislocation or subluxation. And just because they're not a teenager anymore doesn't mean the story's over. So many patients with a 40 degree curve have go, go on to a curve greater than 60 degrees, even into adulthood. So long-term follow-up is very important for these patients. And of course, with progressive scoliosis comes associated problems. And one of the main reasons we talk about intervention. So respiratory dysfunction, you can't really perform PFTs on many of these patients. So hard to study, but they have shown that there's increased risk of respiratory illnesses, such as pneumonia and aspiration pneumonia and tracheomalacia and GERD. And one of the biggest thing we talk about as orthopedic surgeons is sitting discomfort. So the pelvic obliquity can then lead to rib impingement where really the high pelvis drives directly into the ribs and back pain. This then causes difficulty with hygiene for the caregivers and decreased socialization. So when children aren't able to interact with their environment, it definitely has a big impact on their quality of life. So next step is the clinical evaluation. It's really hard to tell about pain because many are nonverbal or have difficulty communicating pain, but we really need to look at the size and the flexibility of the spinal deformity. Here you can see Dr. Howard doing a three-point test where, you know, with a little bit of traction and push, the curve corrects nicely. And we need to look for a pelvic obliquity. We need to look for the entire pediatric exam. It's very crucial in these children. So upper extremity contractures, lower extremity contractures, hip exam, and uh, skin exam for any ulcers are key. And really, we, I like to call it a wheelchair exam, but um, children with high involvement neuromuscular conditions spend a majority of their time in the wheelchair. So adequate seating is very, very important. And uh, next step is the radiographic evaluation. So we really don't have a consensus on when and how often it should be done. But once you know a child has neuromuscular diagnosis, then it's important to do at least yearly exams. And we often do six month exams depending on uh, degree of involvement. And many people would recommend doing a yearly erect AP whole spine from eight years of age. And at least for the first uh, image, I would get a lateral. And if it's an ambulatory patient, I might get a lateral at later stages too, depending on level of pain and degree of progression, because up to 20% of patients have been noted to have uh, spondylolysis or spondylolisthesis in the lower lumbar spine. So here's a patient with SMA with a rapidly progressive and high degree curve. And you can see on the lateral here, it's again, a three-dimensional deformity is a huge kyphosis, big lordosis. And much of these vertebrae look like you're looking at an AP, even though it's a lateral image. So radiographs, uh, erect is always better. It gives you a better understanding of what's happening with the curve and sitting position, which the child most often is doing, but it's tough. You, know, you need to have a brace or you need to have them uh, as some sort of uh, mechanism built in place to hold the patient up to get these radiographs. And, um, we also have, you know, in many centers across the U.S., the um, e EOS system, which is a slot scanner, and this gives you a much lower radiation dose and much greater image detail in an almost three-dimensional fashion, um, gives you a true understanding of the rotation and the degree of curvature, and they have um, built-in seating ad adapters for their older machine, and they're working on one for the newer machine.
So the treatment goals uh, really were looking at multiple stages of treatment goals. So from a coronal alignment standpoint, we want the pelvis to be level. We want the shoulders level. We want the head directly above the pelvis. And we want the shoulders right above the pelvis. And then from a sagittal standpoint, we want the body weight on the proximal part of the thigh, right over the pelvis and the hip bones, rather than leaning forward or back. And you want the head upright, so they're looking directly ahead. And uh, again, the point of treatment is to lower risk of progression, make sure they sit comfortably, and it's also to help patients and caregivers from a daily quality of life standpoint. So here's a great example of that same SMA patient pre-op to post-op. So, you know, she's a totally verbal, intelligent, normally speaking and functioning child who is just having great difficulty. You can see from the pelvic obliquity and the curvature, and she's holding herself up here, but just two months after surgery, sitting beautifully and functioning with, with life as, as she prefers. So what are the treatment options? Um, we always talk about therapy, and we, we know it's important for kids with neuromuscular conditions to keep their joints and muscles supple and long. But really, from a spine standpoint, it's been pretty ineffective. And then there was a brief discussion of electrical stimulation uh, known to be ineffective. And botulinum toxin, there was really all the craze for a long time, even for the extremities, and people looked into it for a uh, scoliosis standpoint, and really... Um, the studies are pretty poorly done or the um, sample size is pretty low or not enough follow-up, but really we don't think there's a benefit. And even in the extremities, you know, Dr. Howard and others have done great studies showing maybe it's not as good as we once thought, right? It can definitely uh, help with casting and stretching the muscles, but the associated fibrosis and scarring may weaken the muscle, even though it's always been thought to be a reversible effect. And then we talk about bracing, seating modifications, and baclofen. But really what's key here is the age and flexibility in terms of how you take care of these patients. So bracing historically uh, resulted in pretty high failure rates because people were using rigid TLSOs and difficulty with compliance, as you can imagine. But really the main goal of bracing today is for seating improvement. And uh, there was some thought, does it compress the chest and affect pulmonary function, but we don't think so. And then really one of the main things is it may delay the need for surgery. We, you know, if a kid has more than a 40 degree curve and they're eight and we know it's gonna progress, putting the brace on may allow them to grow for a year or two or for the weary patient uh, parents who don't want surgery yet, it may be a chance to do something so they feel like you're not just ignoring the child or rushing to surgery. So, but in the more ambulatory patients, the GMFCS ones and twos, uh, bracing may be more successful because we, we think it's more AIS-like. And seating, uh, adapting the wheelchair is crucial. So three-point pressure to turn the curve, like in that picture where you saw Dr. Howard pushing on the spine, would be beneficial. And uh, there's studies on this too, and really with various configurations, you can even get an x-ray in the chair to see if you're making a difference. Then intrathecal baclofen. So this was always known to be pretty useful for reducing global spasticity, but its effect on spine and scoliosis is still controversial. So some case series have shown that it actually worsens it. There's others showing there's no difference. And then the timing of use of the baclofen is still unclear. Um, people claim it, it results in no increased complications. Others say that it does, but um, it's still up in the air on how exactly baclofen plays a role in uh, scoliosis. But if from an extremity standpoint, we know it's a, it's a great cost-effective method in treating spasticity and improving pain uh, for highly involved children. So um, it's really two different worlds here when you look at AIS and uh, cerebral palsy or neuromuscular. So um, this is a slide from Dr. Sponseller, who's also a great uh, teacher and mentor of mine. It's, you know, in AIS, you're, you, you want a balanced spine. It's pretty low risk and really ceiling effects. And what we mean by that is, you know, we're already really, really good at it. And um, there's very little 
chance for improvement, but it's a total opposite in neuromuscular. They're very unbalanced or much higher risk and, you know, we're getting better at it, but um, still a totally different game than in AIS. So, you know, everything's different. Like we just mentioned that uh, procedures are more demanding. The patients are higher risk. The family and social histories are complex. Um, complication rates anywhere up to 60%. So really a multidisciplinary approach is key. And uh, there's a JBJS article just last month talking about um, whether patients or caregivers in this setting really understand um, what we're talking about in the decision-making. And turns out we're not as good as, at explaining it or involving the patients or caregivers as we might think. So a team approach is important. You, you, you don't want just the orthopedic surgeon involved. You want to get complex care of a multidisciplinary approach. You want the GI and pulmonary and neurologists and endocrinologists involved. You want to get standard labs. You want a nutrition or a G-tube consult. And really, you know, depending on family preferences and degree of involvement and curvature, even palliative care plays a big role. So in terms of bone density, um, low bone density has been associated with non-ambulatory patients. So this just results in higher risk of pullout and implant failures. And this can be from poor nutrition, non-weight bearing, and even seizure medications can decrease bone density. So in many of these patients, bisphosphonates have been considered. And nutrition, like I mentioned, is, is huge. So um, we used to often talk about serum albumin levels and lymphocyte counts, which in one of the earlier studies had shown decreased rate of infection and need for intubation and lower rate of hospitalization. But, um, you know, one of the ways to get to that level is by supplementing with NG tube feeding or TPN or even G tubes. And we'll show you later that G tubes is one of the highest risks for infections. But Perhaps this is because the sicker patients are the ones with G-tubes or needing the G-tubes. So really you can wait until these labs are improved and the metabolic requirements after surgery, we know it's gonna be high, but again, these are somewhat arbitrary levels and some may never get there. And just recently a group from CHOP published this paper talking about nutrition consultation. And really it doesn't lead to the weight optimization that we might have hoped for, but G-tubes were found to be helpful. So again, this is a difficult problem. You want to build it, do, do so with a team. You really want to involve the crowds, as they say. And um, here we do a multidisciplinary conference, uh, including the PICU and the uh, GI and pulmonary and infectious disease doctors and the surgeons and anesthesiologists every month um, before doing these spine cases. And you really want the A-team in the operating room. So your usual uh, surgical tech and nurses and anesthesiologists. And uh, we use a two attending model. So I do all of these cases with an orthopedic surgeon. And that's been shown to reduce surgical time, EBL, uh, better Cobb angles and better percent correction and even decrease complications. So, um, you know, not every one of these patients is the same. And uh, this is what I had mentioned before. Uh, Dr. Jane from Hopkins talk, taught us about this comorbidity complication where, you know, not every patient with GMFCS5 is a patient with GMFCS5. So in seizure disorders, uh, being nonverbal, having a trach or G-tube are involved, it really increases the complication rates pretty dramatically. And um, next step would be surgery. So we've done all the analysis and the evaluation and involved the teams and now we're ready for surgery. How do we do it? So it really started with, here's a, an evolution of how it went by. You got the Harrington rods and wires and the Lukey wires and then eventually hook rod systems and then a unit rod. And now we're finally up to pedicle screw and SAI constructs. So this was a unit rod. I was lucky enough to, uh, C2 of these, which it's very infrequently done, but uh, Dr. Miller, one of the godfathers of uh, cerebral palsy and neuromuscular care at, uh, at DuPont um, 
was still operating and I had a chance to do it with him. And clearly it results in a great result. Uh, you can see it's, it depends on a cantilever mechanism, not much instrumentation, put a bunch of wires in, put the uh, legs into the, straighten it out. But now we use pedicle screws. So really the modern construct looks like the one on the left rather than on the right. And um, we, we've looked at this does it really matter is it worthwhile to use these uh, more expensive and involved equipments and really no difference in quality of life but the wires depend on translational correction uh, which you can do but in a weak osteoporotic bone like i showed earlier there's a higher chance of pull out and breakage and with pedicle screws you get better rotational correction you get uh, better stabilization if you're doing osteotomy. So you get less bleeding and you get less need for anterior surgeries because you theoretically control the anterior part of the vertebral body with the screws and you have a lower reoperation rate. So um, most modern centers rely purely on pedicle screw type fixation. And then um, the pelvic fixation has undergone an evolution too. So Dr. Sponseller taught us about the S2AI screws. So this is really a genius move. Um, this can be used in place of the unit rod legs or traditional iliac bolts. So it has a lower profile for the screw heads and it sits right in line with the lumbar screws, your L4, L5, and S1 screws. And it's technically more demanding, especially if you have a lot of intrapelvic deformity, but with the advent of navigation and learning from people who've been doing this for decades, it's, it's not that much more time consuming or difficult. You can see here, the screws go directly across the SI joint and sit directly above the strong piece of bone above the sciatic notch. So what's the evidence? So the, this is the Galveston, or like you saw in the unit rods, and then you have the iliac bolts here with the cross connectors. And then here you have the SAI screws where you don't need the cross connector, but it crosses across the SI joint. So between the iliac screw and the Galveston, really not much difference. And we have good evidence to show that the iliac screw is not much superior. Maybe easier to put in because it's two separate pieces that connect rather than one long um, piece of stainless steel. But the SAI screw, more and more studies have shown us that it's, it's better. So you get better pelvic obliquity correction, you get less skin complications, you get less complications with the implants themselves from connector breakage or loosening. And you can see here, uh, it's pretty high magnitude. This patient had uh, genetic abnormality in GMFCS5, cerebral palsy, so we did this all from the back with um, skin traction and Gardner-Wells traction. And this is known as a kickstand rod. So you have two SAI screws, but you can put in a third rod in an iliac fashion, but it's still pretty under the muscle because it, this is the SAI screw, the kickstand one goes up here and you distract throughout the case and it results in a pretty good um, outcome for this patient. So surgery is all done and you feel pretty good about it, but um, you know the wound care or post-operative care is really where everything is even more crucial in my opinion. So you really need a meticulous wound closure. You have to do a multi-layer closure. People have talked about using plastic surgeons and in some cases I work very closely with a plastic surgeon here who might come in and help us. And you wanna use a non-permeable dressing you want to do dressing changes and you want to be as a surgeon really involved with the dressing changes. And uh, you can even consider things like wound facts. And then post-operative pain. So many of these patients can't tell us that they're hurting. So we have to use this FLAC score. So it looks at the face, legs, activity, crying and consolability, which you often use for children who aren't able to communicate with us. And we really use a multimodal pain control. So We've done away with PCAs. We've done away with IV narcotics uh, after post-op day zero. We rely on gabapentin, Valium, Toradol, and Oxycodone, really. And uh, this should really be the standard of care and I think has been across the country. So, um, so complications are a many. So here's just a small list of the many complications that can happen in these 
fragile children. So bleeding, hypotension during surgery, coagulopathy, you really want to communicate with the anesthesiologist during surgery so that they're not just being given fluids, which can worsen the coagulopathy. You really want to replete with packed blood cells and FFPs, um, post-op pneumonia, increase in seizures, UTI pre-op can be a risk factor for infection later, and um, pancreatitis, and of course, instrumentation-related complications. So uh, here's a paper that we're pretty proud of that we publish uh, or in the process of publishing. This won us the Hibbs Award uh, two years ago. And, you know, we talked about 10-year complications from AIS and we said the overall complication rate is about 12%, but that's still probably pretty high given that follow-up was a little bit limited in this study and in, as expected with this patient population. But that's not, that's not a terrible complication rate. But when you look at the neuromuscular patients, complication rates are much, much greater, and it really blows your mind. Um, so Dr. Lonstein uh, published a study showing up to 60%, and then Dr. Mohammed from San Diego showing about 33%, and uh, worse with double-stage procedures. And the stark difference, as I mentioned earlier, is, is pretty alarming. And in terms of infection, there's uh, rates anywhere from you know, 10 to 25% across the literature. And uh, it happens to all of us. So this is one of my patients who was doing great, but came back with a wound dehiscence and an infection. And we're currently working on getting it closed. And he's doing fine, but he had um, MRSA infection. He had a history of MRSA. And uh, preoperatively, we did all the usual steps that we did, but it happens. And we're getting better at it, but uh, we're not quite there yet. And one of the big changes is in the way we use antibiotics. So it's not just ANSEF, like for every other orthopedic procedure. So for diaper dependent folks, we often use things like gentamicin um, because we know there's a higher risk of E. coli or gram negative infections and history of MRSA. We often, or if you're in a hospital or a city where MRSA is more prevalent, we use vancomycin. And we continue that for 48 hours after surgery rather than just 24. And one of the big difference makers has been local antibiotics. So we talk about vancomycin powder. Um, you can do that, mix it right into the bone graft. And uh, Dr. Miller was one of the first to talk about it. He used gentamicin and noted a big decrease in wound infection rates. But it's not, it's not totally benign, right? These uh, certainly have effects in a recent study to be published next month, actually, talks about how vancomycin powder may be associated with other types of infections. So is it just selecting for different uh, bugs that may be even harder to treat? So in 2013, um, a big group of pediatric orthopedic surgeons um, published this best practice guideline. And we followed this pretty closely. You know, they see infectious disease pre-op, and they, which is where they really talk about the skin wash and what to expect if there's an infection and how to deal with it and the outcomes. Uh, we get pre-op lab work and urine cultures and treat it if needed. They get a big education sheet and uh, we do a nutritional assessment with the GI doctor if they already have a G-tube or with a nutritionist. Um, we do antibiotics based on uh, their history. So do ANSEF or and GENT or VANC and GENT. Um, we, and then uh, we keep a close eye on them post-operatively and the uh, doors closed while we're in the operating room and we really try to limit it. We looked at this and before we did that, just from an idiopathic case, uh, a six hour procedure from entry to leaving the room, 87 times the door was open, which, which is pretty, pretty wild. And I, I was... We all guessed beforehand and nobody was close to that 87 number. So after following this um, best practice guidelines, uh, one group noted a 72% decrease in infection rate. Another complication is blood loss. So even with excellent technique, these patients are gonna have or could have high volume blood loss. So 40% in the harm study group. So these are some of the best surgeons in the world who have more than one volume blood loss. Um, 
And you can see another study by Dr. Jane here, the CP and neuromuscular groups had the greatest amount of blood loss. And seizure medications, again, can increase this from a coagulopathy standpoint. So now we use antifibrinolytics. This has been used for a couple of, almost two decades now. And um, in every method of assessing blood loss, patients on TXA, for example, had less blood loss. And then neuromonitoring. So it's standard practice for us to monitor all these patients, but it can be really difficult um, due to the cerebral anomalies and anatomical differences. Um, but we still do, but really the question is, say you don't have great signals, is it gonna change whether or not you proceed with surgery? And I think that is an important point to discuss preoperatively, and I do so with all my patients. Uh, and many of them say they, they agree to proceed with it. So in those cases, you can try increasing latency, you can try stimulating, you can try ketamine um, to see if you can potentiate the signals. But uh, many times it's worthwhile from a quality of life standpoint to proceed as long as the family understands. And um, another study I worked on as a fellow in DuPont was looking at the life expectancy on these patients. So in Australia, they looked at Rett syndrome patients who had surgery and didn't. They have a nice big registry they can look at, which we unfortunately don't. Um, because So we didn't have a non-operative group to compare to. So these were all patients who had surgery. And there were about 500 patients from a single institution. And we noticed that a uh, large number of them survive to more than 30 years after surgery, which, which is great. So it's not like they're undergoing this big risky procedure for a minimal benefit. And if you look at time from surgery, over half of them survive for over 20 years after surgery. So if these patients are 13, 14 years old, they're living well into their uh, late 30s and 40s. And then, uh, of course, we looked at other factors. So surgery age makes a difference on survivability. So the younger you are, uh, the less likelihood of longer term survival, which makes sense. Uh, having a G-tube again reduces uh, survival probability. Pulmonary issues reduce survival probability. And length of stay in the hospital or ICU reduces level of survivability. So if you stayed longer, which you might if you're a sicker patient, um, you have a lower survivability than those that don't. And then surgical era. So we looked at, you know, are we getting better at these surgeries? So this wasn't statistically significant, but you can see a pretty good trend here. So in the early, uh, we broke it up into decades, in the early age stages, compared to the most recent, you can see that uh, there's clearly a trend for us doing better. And that's consistent with uh, studies looking at the general uh, population of patients with cerebral palsy, for example. Uh, they tend to live longer now. So what about the outcomes? So we've talked about everything from evaluation to x-rays, to surgeries, to complications, but is it all worth it? And overall, the literature shows that most patients and families would do it again, despite these complications and risks. So, and the Tupon group was one of the first to talk about this in a small number, but 86% talked about surgery, that's recommended surgery. And then they updated it and the number went up even more. So um, in 2011, Dr. Narayanan from SickKids uh, published on his CP child score. So it's a validated method of looking at quality of life in patients with cerebral palsy, for example. And it looks at comfort, pain, ability of the caregivers to take care of these children. And uh, it was a really good way to look at whether our interventions are making a difference. So Dr. Boats et al. from uh, in 2011 were one of the first to use the CP child and looked at patients who underwent surgery. They noted a 16% complication rate. They looked at 50 children. Uh, didn't have control group and it's low numbers, but it was a good start. And um, they noted improvements in many different categories of the CP child questionnaire. 
and um, even pain improved. So 92% of these caregivers were satisfied and 0% said they would not do the procedure again. So 100% of them would do it again. And there's no correlation between quality of life and degree of correction or post-op complications. And then Dr. Mianji from Vancouver uh, looked at a longer term study from the HARM study group, and it was a collected data in a prospective manner. And they noted that these patients had improved personal care, improved comfort, improved positioning, and improved total, total CP child score. So you know, these guys noted a complication rate of 46% at one year. And importantly, this was not correlated with quality of life. And some of the significant risks were pneumonia, infection, and pancreatitis. And then next, Dr. Miller uh, from Gillette Children's uh, in 2020 looked at even a greater number of patients, 157, two-year follow-up though here. And they noted that the overall scores improved, um, not average by six points, but 36% had a greater than a 10-point change, which means that's a really meaningful improvement. And age at surgery, GMFCS involvement, and again, complications were not related to overall quality of life improvements. So then uh, in, again, in 2020, uh, bigger group of patients, harm study group again, multi-center study, uh, looked at what predictors really affect quality of life improvement. So in this group, 32% had at least one complication and 8% had a deep infection. So they noted that a deep infection causes declines in the comfort and emotions part of the quality of life domains, but other complications really had no effect. So really uh, some of the predictors on improvement were that if you have a lower pre-op CP child score to start with, then you have a better post-op score. But this may mean that even if you have a low score to start with, surgery may not, surgery may play a role in keeping that from worsening, which is very important, different, but important. And then uh, again, deep infection predicted less improvement in the post-op scores. Uh, other factors that did not have an effect, uh, GMFCS level, nonverbal, intellectual disability level, having a hip dislocation, and again, curve correction and age at surgery. So what are the common themes we're looking at here, right? So scoliosis surgery really does improve quality of life and we have more and more data to support it. And this is tr especially true in terms of comfort and emotions, which you extrapolate to pain levels. And then worse quality of life pre-op, it means better improvement post-op. And even though you have high complication rates, they don't tend to have an effect on the quality of life except for deep infection. And then uh, higher complication rates with more comorbidities, which is not unexpected. And curve correction really doesn't have an effect as long as you get them balanced. So how do we get better? I, I said before that there's a floor effect in play here. So uh, we know that this helped patients, but what's really important here is to have a peer-to-peer -peer comparison. So you know what makes one center or one surgeon better than another? And it's really important to share these practices and look at prospectively collected data. And even though many people have been doing this for many years, we need to continue to get better, reduce the blood loss, reduce operative time, reduce length of stay, and reduce these complications. So uh, I wanna end by talking uh, about a few other brief topics. So anterior surgery, do we ever need it? What about traction? And then what about the young, very young patients? So anterior surgery pretty common place in the past and would have been uh, definitely done for many curves, uh, historically over 90 degrees. But these are both patients here who did not have um, anterior base surgery, just posterior. So anterior surgery has increased surgical time and blood loss. It's an additional exposure, can have pulmonary difficulties. But uh, like I mentioned before, with use of the pedicle screw, we really haven't needed it very much. And um, our goal, again, 
is to correct the spinal balance. You wanna get a balanced child that can interact with the environment. It's not about getting a zero degree Cobb angle at the end of the day. So what do we do with these stiff curves now if we're not going anterior? So traction and distraction is super useful. So, and that comes in many ways. So it can be pure Gardner-Wells tongs with a weight attached. You can do Gardner-Wells tongs with tape type traction on the lower extremity. Uh, you can even uh, do the taping in a way so that you can put a hanger or hook and hang weight off the bottom. And um, additional things have been to use femoral traction. You can put a femoral traction pin in to counter and pull the pelvis down. And there's also intraoperative traction where like the kickstand rod I showed you before, uh, you can put an additional rod in and distract throughout the case or attach to the rib and distract throughout the case. And what about the young child? So historically, if you're under 10, um, they would get a growing construct of some sort, whether this is the traditional growing rods or magnetically controlled growing rods. Uh, more and more data has shown us that you can safely do a fusion up to down to eight years of age. Uh, and you get rid of the high complication rates that are often seen with these growing rod type constructs. So here's another one of our studies that uh, won an award at SRS a couple of years ago. Uh, we looked at whether definitive fusions are better than these growth friendly maneuvers or growth sparing maneuvers. Um, and we found that in patients eight to 10 years of age with cerebral palsy, um, there were fewer complications in reoperations and better radiographic outcomes. I know I said the radiographic outcomes don't matter, but we looked at it anyway, uh, when compared to growing rod type constructs. And then Dr. Lee from Michigan published in uh, 2021, showing pretty much the exact same results, much greater complications and unplanned return to the operating room when using a growth friendly type device. And then Dr. Lauer from Nashville at Vanderbilt uh, just published this year, um, showing very similar results uh, in these young patients with scoliosis. What about the super young patients? So we, we think that if they're eight or above, a fusion is a better option than uh, growth sparing uh, surgery. But what about the you know two, three-year-old with early onset scoliosis? So um, we've, we've been doing casting and it shows to be beneficial. So uh, you can put them in an EDF type cast or a meta cast. And uh, although it doesn't seem to prevent the need for surgery, which we can often see in idiopathic early onset scoliosis, it does result in a substantial delay in the need for surgery. So it really could be an effective strategy for delaying the eventual surgery. So if it's a three-year-old and you're able to cast until eight, uh, maybe you can skip the growing rod stage, maybe. So in conclusion, scoliosis is pretty common in patients with neuromuscular conditions. We all know that, but in progressive curves, mostly in the more involved patients, it often involves or needs surgery. And we tend to be able to do it all from the back now, especially with better um, preoperative surveillance and um, multidisciplinary approach to the care. We get to these patients earlier and in a more safe fashion. And surgery is, is good. It involves and improves the patient's and the caregiver's quality of life. And again, complication rates are high, but we're doing things and moving forward in a way to make it better and better. And I can't stress enough the importance of having a team approach and involving all the other uh, providers and uh, doctors and nurses and PAs and surgical team that are involved in the care of these patients. So, and of course the family needs to be completely involved in understanding of uh, the patient's condition and why we're doing this and what they can expect afterwards. So it's, uh, it's one of my favorite uh, patient populations to take care of. And, um, you know, I, I find great joy in taking care of these patients and their families, despite uh, some of the higher risk, because I, I do feel that uh, just from an anecdotal standpoint, they're very happy with the results, even after complications. Thanks very much.
Thank you, Arun, for that brilliant presentation. Arun, you can stop sharing, actually. Okay, great. Okay, great. Uh, and great presentation and congratulations for the great work that you're doing at uh, Florida. Couple of questions okay. from our side. Uh, I sure. just want to make it clear for those who are watching this particular program. Uh, in a neuromuscular scoliosis, invariably we need to get, I mean, screws into the pelvis, right? So pelvic fixation is a part of neuromuscular scoliosis, right? Compared to a standard idiopathic AIS. Yeah, I think, um, well, that's, it depends on the patient. So in most of these higher and more involved uh, neuromuscular patients, yeah, pelvic fixation is a must. You don't want to stop short. That's a bad day when you have to fix somebody that gets pelvic obliquity after being stopped short. But if you're looking at, you know, the GMFCS one, two, maybe some threes without much pelvic obliquity, and they have the more common S type idiopathic type curves, then it's okay not to go to the pelvis. So invariably, you're going to have a very long incision from the nape of the neck to the, I mean, L5 S1 area, isn't it? Sure, for sure. Yeah. Unless Almost it's a true mid thoracic curve in a GMFCS1. Sure. Great. And the other question is how early to operate? For example, you have mentioned the role of serial casting. If someone is in like three years or something, and you can delay surgery as far as possible. And you also mentioned that a standard PSF is good from eight years onwards. It doesn't really affect the growth. So someone who is between say five to eight, do you think a magnetic control growth, growth rods are great? Because you, you mentioned that magnetic growth rods have been associated with significant complications. And this particular age group, what do you think? Yeah, I think that five to eight group is a perfect place for use of magnetic controlled rods or even traditional rods, uh, whatever you're more comfortable with and whatever is available. Um, you know, that's the age group where it's tough to cast, but a little bit too young to go on diffusion. So um, the complication rates are higher, sure. And things like autofusion and proximal junctional kyphosis and screw pull out and implant failure. But if you're going to go one route, we think that the magnetic rods have less complications and less, of course, need for unplanned return to the operating room than traditional growing rods. So in that four to eight group, um, especially with high magnitude curves, I think it's a wonderful idea. And uh, what about using the standard, like you mentioned that uh, a standard PSF can also be used in a younger age group, right? So there's always a risk of crankshaft, is it? Is that the concern that you have when you operate on less than eight years? Yeah, less than eight years, crankshaft is the main concern. Um, but, you know, we've looked at patients with idiopathic and congenital scoliosis too, who've had fusions at eight, and crankshaft, you know, from eight onwards isn't that big of a concern because the pedicle screw really goes to the anterior and we don't think it affects uh, the anterior overgrowth as much as the purely posterior based wires or hooks might have. And of course, in many of these patients, they um, are, you know, undergoing a rapid phase of growth or puberty at a younger age because of many of the endocrine abnormalities. So, um, I think eight is a perfectly safe time to do fusions. Under eight, the crankshaft is, is more of a concern. Uh, thank you, Aaron, for that. And off late, we've seen a lot of interest in uh, non-fusion technology, right? Magnetic, I mean, virtual body tethering, yeah. VBT. I mean, a lot of surgeons have popularized a, a VBT. And do you think there could be a role for uh, neuromuscular, especially those which are, I mean, stage one or small curves? Yeah, there, there are certainly surgeons who are doing a, a VBT for these case patients, and they've um, I've seen uh, preliminary presentations on this, but I think the data is not strong enough, at least in my opinion, to consider it for these patients yet. And, and what about the, the future? Epifix, is yeah, Epifix device. I mean, again, a, a smaller, smaller system, and uh, recently I think it's been... Yeah. Um, the US and it's still not FDA approved if I, if I believe. Uh, I'm not entirely sure. I don't think it is. Um, I talked to Dr. Uh, El Hawari about it a few weeks ago in Miami. He, he's done a lot of work on it, um, but the limitations on that are the indications are even more limited than in the VBT group. And um, again, I think we know even less about it than we know about BBT groups, but maybe in the future. But for me, uh, at present, I am not offering it. To it's too early. We don't have long-term data to propose either BBT or Epifix device, right? 
I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Arun. I think uh, Arun, that's all the questions that we have for the session. I mean, it was a fantastic talk, and I'm sure this is going to benefit a lot of people all over the world. Thank you so much, Arun. Well, thanks so much for doing this again. It's truly Bye. a privilege. Bye.